Hi, welcome to Whiskey and Wool. This is my season two of Knitter's Life, the Knitter's Life series. This is season two, episode two. My name is Shannon. Welcome, welcome. I'm so glad to see you. It's so nice to take a little time out of my weekend to just chat with you about my knitting and spinning project. Yeah. Um, I'm so excited <laughs> to talk to you today. Uh, yeah. Oh, um, I, before I jump into uh, my knitting, I wanted to just share with you a little, a couple little things. So my son showed me this handy little device for lighting candles. So I got this cute little device. Um, from Amazon. It is a laser lighter. Uh, <laughs> I think you can see there. Um, for candles and it is uh, rechargeable. So you can just use your USB um, plug and yeah, it isn't it cool. It was 10 bucks, Amazon. <laughs> also, I wanted to ask, are you playing Wordle? So I discovered Wordle by reading, I think I read about it in the New York Times. And um, yeah, so I've been playing, I'll pop on here. I've played 16 days in a row. So I'll pop on here the my chart. If you don't know about it, it's a, uh, a word game where you, uh, you're looking for a five letter word. You have six times to guess the correct word and uh, yeah, it'll it'll show you if it's if the letter lights up when you put in a word like the word horse, for example. If um, R and S light up yellow, you've guessed correct letters, but they're in incorrect spots. And if the other letter, like say the O, um, lights up green, then it's the right letter in the right spot. And if the other letters, um, like maybe the H or yes, the H and E are black, that means those letters are not in this word at all. So yeah, you get six, six times to try. I've been using it every morning to um, just kind of warm up, warm up my brain and it's so fun. You can only play once a day, <laughs> so. That's kind of that scarcity thing is I don't know. It's also something it's doing something that is uh, crazy and incredible Yeah, anyway, I am going to have you uh, See past me. So last night I filmed a whiskey chat. So I'm gonna have you look at that. Um, this is uh, a Japanese whiskey that I'm tasting. So I delve a little bit into the history of whiskey making in Japan and then we get into uh, tasting the whiskey that I had um, from my uh, one of my advent calendars. So I'm gonna have you watch that. That's gonna be about 15 minutes, maybe a little longer. Um, if you do not want to, if you have no interest in the whiskey chat, I will tell you where to skip to right here on screen so you can just jump ahead. Hi there, welcome to my whiskey chat. I'm gonna try to do this quickly because the sun is setting. Um, it is Friday evening. I just finished work and working out and I'm gonna sit down and enjoy a little whiskey and I thought I would share it with you. This is the only Japanese whiskey that I am, um, that I am tasting from my advent calendar from 2021. Um, that advent calendar, it was, I mean, there have been some very delicious, I've already tasted quite a lot of the bourbons in there, probably about 10 or so bottles of bourbon in there and about, I'd say about 12 single malts. Uh, oh, uh, the whiskey I should tell you is Mars Shinsu EY, EY, EY is the pronunciation tradition whiskey. It retails for about $50 here in the US. Uh, I don't know how many yen that is. <laughs> All right, brief history of um, short snapshot version of whiskey in Japan. Um, whiskey in Japan was pretty much the brainchild of really one man, but he of course needed some help. So another two, uh, two different um, uh, people helped him. 
Um, as far as I can tell, I'm going to really just talk about one man in particular. So I'll tell I'll tell you about the relationship between those two men. So whiskey drinking uh, in in Japan only, as far as we know, only goes back as far as the 1850s when uh, Commodore Matthew Perry sailed into Edo Harbor, Edo, which is now modern day Tokyo, um, and brought along with him about a hundred gallon gallons or so of whiskey and shared it with the Japanese royalty. Uh, if you're not familiar with Japan's Edo period, there was a period of about 50, 60 years, maybe give or take, where Japan did not allow any, um, they shut their borders essentially. So there was nobody, you couldn't get, you couldn't go in. And if you did get in, you weren't allowed to leave. If you snuck off somehow, you weren't allowed back. Um, so they they did their best to guard their borders and keep themselves um, monoculture. So that, that did some interesting things to their culture. Um, and in the meantime, like in that pe- same period of time, the rest of the world was making, you know, technological and, and such a, a, industrial advances. Uh, and they were sheltered from a lot of that for better or worse. Um, that's an interesting story, which, um, I'll let you explore on your own. I'm sure sure Google will help with that. Instead, let's just focus on whiskey. So we're not really sure how the whiskey that Matthew Perry brought along with him was received. There aren't a lot of notes or, um, written documents about it, but, um, several decades later, Um, in, let me tell you the history of this particular man. Um, there was a man named Masa Taka Takasuru. He was born in the 1890s and, uh, he was born into a family that had a sake distillery. Um, and he grew up to, um, decide that his, the sake distillery had been established in the 1700s. So it had been around for quite some time. Um, and he decided to travel to Scotland to study organic chemistry in the 1900s, uh, just after World War I ended. Um, so he went to Scotland to study organic chemistry. And while he was there, he also, um, worked for and apprenticed at several different distilleries, Scottish distilleries, uh, whiskey distilleries. And, um, yeah, he learned the trade. He stayed there for quite some time. He, um, spent some time in Campbelltown. Um, he went to University of Glasgow. So Campbelltown isn't that far from Glasgow. If you have a boat, um, as, as we know, Um, He met and married a Scottish woman in the 1920s, and um, he worked for uh, some time for Springbank Distillery in Campbelltown. He returned to Japan and uh, paired up with this man whose name I want to make sure I say correctly, Shinjiro Tori, who went on later to establish the company Suntory. So Suntory is probably the biggest whiskey um, company in Japan. Um, Certainly like they have owned many, many labels. Um, I'm not going to talk about them now. I'll talk more about them when I get one of their whiskeys to um, to taste at some point in the future. Um, But anyway, um, Masataka, he, uh, he and Tori paired up and established the very first distillery in Japan and started to work on um, brewing, distilling whiskey in Japan. They split a few years later. Um, They had a difference of opinion about where the distillery should be. And since Tori had the money, um, it went where he thought it should be. And so they established it in, hang on. A region that is just, I, I believe it's either west or just northwest of Tokyo. Um, so um, I should keep their names here on a card, placard in front of me. Masataka wanted it to be in Hokkaido, which is the most northern region in Japan. It's an, it's, its own island. Um, and he thought that the climate of the Hokkaido region 
really um, matched the climate of Scotland better and that they would get closer to the Scottish whiskies that he had learned how to make and enjoyed while he was in Scotland. Um, so a few years after they paired up and established this whiskey distillery in um, the, the 1920s, like late 1920s or so, um, they split and um, Masataka went to Hokkaido with his wife, Rita, um, established Nika Whiskey Distillery. Um, so I'm just giving you that background about um, whiskey distilling in Japan. Both of those, Suntory, as I said, is a very big company. Nika Kofi is a very large company too. They, you can find gin distilled by them and also whiskey. Um, so they certainly have um, been able to capitalize on those early roots of um, their founder going to Scotland and learning about distilling, probably gin as well as uh, whiskey, because we know that Scotland makes lovely gins as well as wonderful whiskeys. Uh, okay, so that's the history of whiskey uh, making. The uh, whiskey that I'm tasting today, which is from the Shinsu Mars Distillery. Shinsu Mars was founded in 1985. So what we're gonna find is that Japanese um, distilleries are much younger than the Scottish distilleries. Um, so it was established in 1985 and then it went silent from 1992 until 2011. Um, and it, where, when it was then purchased by Hombo Shuzo Company. Um, and yeah, so they, they've been making, of course, like many distilleries in Japan, um, they may have been making other alcohols, just not whiskey. Um, yeah, so what else can I tell you about Hombo Shuzo? Um, they had a little bit longer history. They had been making, they were an old Japanese uh, liquor company that had been making different liqueurs, um, sake, other things since 1872. Um, and the Shinsu Mars Distillery is located just in a region that is, I'll put a map on here, that's just north of Tokyo. So it's not in that northern region where the Nika um, distillery was founded and I'm pretty sure Nika has di different distilleries all around either the Hokkaido region but also probably other regions of Japan I suspect I'm not sure but that is my suspicion so all right we I've been chatting quite a while about the history of these whiskeys so let's taste first I have a new I have a new um glass this these are by simon pierce these are uh whiskey glasses that have a very heavy bottom um simon pierce is a glass blower a very well-known glass blower here in the u.s and uh his glass factory is in vermont i understand his outlet store is amazing um he lives in a region where uh there's a lot of skiing and snowboarding and stuff like that so vermont is a popular region if you're not familiar with the u.s for skiing especially for those of us who live on the northeast um, it's very convenient um three four hour drive depending on where you live um anyway Simon Pierce new whiskey glasses that I got for Christmas so I really really love them um, as usual I have the whiskey port in the glass and I've put a few drops of water so let's taste it I've been smelling it the whole entire time I'm talking to you and I really want to try it let me see oh interesting so um, I'm smelling cake like definitely um, some buttery tones and also fruit a lot of, it's very fruit forward I smell like red fruits like plum or uh, maybe like it really reminds me of cherry pie <laughs> so like that buttery flaky pie crust with the the tart sweet cherry filling um, what I was going to say is that some of the, after the establishment of the whiskey, of whiskey distilling in Japan, there started to sort of be this infiltration of Japanese, um, sensibilities and, and, um, 
taste aesthetics started to seep into some of the whiskey making. I don't know if I'm gonna taste it so much here, but I've read about some very interesting um, use of some very, of some seasonal, or not seasonal, regional is the word I was looking for, regional um, fruits and plants and things that are that are often in Japanese um, uh, food and stuff. So anyway, cherry pie, something else. Ooh, wow. Oh, this is nice. It has that, um, there's something in there. I don't know what it is. I'm gonna, I'm a little rusty because I haven't done a whiskey tasting in a while. As you know. Um, there's something in there that reminds me a lot about of the Scottish whiskeys. It's, it's in the middle. So up front, fruity, vanilla, caramel, I would say is in there. The the, um, I'm waiting for the pastry. There's a burn in there that reminds me so much of, um, of the Scottish whiskeys. I need to read what it says I should be tasting because I am dying to know. Okay, so it says sweet with fruit flavors like pear, quince, and red fruits and vanilla got that right um i did find another um couple of tastings and because this is from flavier i also have information from them so let me read what they say about it oh ca caramel caramel cherry sherry honey spice ginger peat i tasted a little peat um i just wasn't sure that was right so uh, some other interesting things is that the barley and some of the, um, the grain products that are used in making whiskey in Japan are imported from Scotland. So they're using, they're trying to use very authentic, um, ingredients. So, okay. So Mars Shin Shu Ey. Tradition whiskey is named for Kilcharo Iwai, who was also known as the silent pioneer of Japanese whiskey. So Kilcharo Iwai is the founder of Hombo Shinzu. So the, this whiskey is named for the founder of the company that now owns this label. Um, okay. Um, and he was also, oh, that was the connection with Ma Masataka. So he was a mentor of Masataka at some point um, before Masataka founded um, Nika. So uh, again, this company was founded in the 1870s. So he would have been much older, a couple decades older than Masataka. Um, all right. Uh, so this special Japanese blend is distilled with the waters that pass through the granite rock, which is high in minerals and natural minerals. EY is a blended whiskey made of both single malts, grains, and blend and other blended whiskeys. The mixture is then aged in a combination of ex bourbon, ex sherry, and ex wine casks, um, creating a perfect trifecta of harmonious flavor. Shinzu's whiskeys are quality manifestations of their long-standing history of distilling. They have a saying, I'm going to not read it in J Japanese, instead I'm going to give you the translation, which is, wisdom gotten from age is better than the shell of a tortoise. <laughs> With age comes wisdom and damn good whiskey. Oh, our first Japanese whiskey here on Whiskey and Wool. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope this, I hope I can lighten up this whole thing because it's awfully dark um yeah and i'm wearing pink velvet in case you're wondering by andrea mowry it's a sweater that i made a few years ago i'll have information in the description box about it if i remember and if i forget please and you're interested remind me i'll link my project page but anyway i don't know what they say in japan do they say cheers do they say throw it back I don't know. But anyway, here you go. I need to figure that out. Maybe I'll put it on screen if I get it in editing. Bye. <laughs>
cast on my scrappy blanket that I'm making out of the knit collage mini skeins and some hand spun. I um, added to this too, I recovered two full skeins of knit collage from an old scarf that I had made um, many, many years ago. Uh, I don't even know what this uh, yarn is. It may be an early version of Dreamland. Um, but yes, yeah, so I have two of those. So I've been knitting, this wasn't what I intended, but I've been holding these two strands together and I've been, I started with them actually cast on. I did about four rows. Actually, I think I did three rows. I think that's my cast on down there. And uh, I arranged the yarns in a sort of color scheme. Um, so at some point this saffron color will be worked in and then I'll end with this um, purple toned hand spun. Um, I'm not sure, so I, I've been incorporating this every couple rows, which I think you can see. Um, it looks like the mini skeins will go for three rows. Uh, and so I've been alternating in the, um, I think this is called, I'll put the name on, on screen. I can't remember exactly. Lifelong Yarns. I got it at EYF. I have only three skeins of it and I've been holding two together. So I don't know how successful I'm going to be in carrying these across the entire blanket, but I do want to uh, hold one strand with this one because this one just isn't thick enough to stand up to the the thickness of the um knit collage this is also hand spun i think it'll be fine i think there's enough thick thin to it that it should be fine compared to the knit collage yeah uh, so yeah, this is, I just decided to go ahead and do it because I realized this would be a very fast project and I should just bang it out because now's the time that I want something like this. So, so far so good. A little concerned about running out of these. I may need to be a little more sparing as I go through um, this blanket to make that last. I wanted to give you a quick update on my scrappy knit collage slash hand spun blanket. <laughs> I, um, yeah, this is after about a day or so of knitting, maybe a day and a half since I last recorded. Um, so I'm just basically doing, um, you know, knitting on this exclusively. So the rest of my projects, which are over there, are being neglected while I just crank through this and I'm probably what I would think is about halfway done. Um, this here in the middle is my hand spun. So this is uh, not as lofty as the knit collage. So I started to mix in some of those mini skeins. I found that I'm getting about three rows with the mini skeins. So this is one right here, this orangey one, and then this pink one is a mini skein, and then there's another one in here. So I can get about three rows across, and then this is a full skein, what you're seeing in here, mixed in with some of that, uh, those two strands of DK held together, just to kind of give a high-low effect. Uh, and I think it's coming along pretty nicely. So since this wasn't as lofty, I did mix in a mini skein here and there. And I am um, almost done with that whole skein, or that all that uh, hand spun. I have this hand spun left, which as I mentioned before, is quite a bit thinner. So I will be holding this with um, a strand of the DK weight that I have from EYF. Uh, so I decided to, I'm trying really hard not to cut the yarns. So that is something that <laughs> that's happening. So the two strands of DK that I'm holding together, I am carrying along up the side of the um, blanket. So I haven't, I actually did cut it one time only because I was, I ran out mid row on with one of the mini skeins and I needed something to just finish off the row. So, so far. <laughs> so that, that's, I consider that a success. I didn't mention this last time, but my needle size is a um, US size 15, 
10 millimeter or 10 millimeter needle and I am I believe I said before I'm knitting in a one by one rib pattern um, I chose one by one because it is a true reversible stitch so it didn't I wanted one that where I didn't it didn't matter which side was up and then what I'm going to do when I'm completely finished and after it's blocked, I'm going to go back and needle felt the any ends that are that are hanging out. Um, I even, can't even find one right now, but there are a handful of ends here and there that I want to just go back in and needle felt so that they're really, really attached. But so far, I'm really loving the way this is looking and I think I was worried that the size would end up being too small but I think I'm it's going to be fine because I should be able to knit from the edge to here again like that amount again which I think will give me a pretty nice size I should end up with like a probably like 50 inch by 50 inch which is perfect for a throw I completely need to watch the video clips that I make in in between the two weeks that I am making these full episodes because I just spent 15 minutes talking about a project that I already talked about in the process of developing the project. So I'm not going to delay and I will show you that I have finished my scrappy throw this was about three and a half days maybe four days of uh knitting nothing but this throw i have it folded in half just so that i could fit it um so i think you saw up to about here in the video clips and i have now finished it i really love it it is so squishy and warm it is everything that i wanted i am so happy that i went ahead and did it because I, yeah, I was thinking about it after I finished recording my last episode, episode one, and I was thinking to myself, I should make that throw now because the weather is so cold and um, on very cold days, the house feels even chillier. And yes, I could throw up the heat, but how fun is it to just grab a throw and put it over your legs and your lap and sit and be nice and cozy um, and and warm so yeah so that I just decided to go for it and go ahead and knit it and I'm so glad I did it knit up super fast um, again I was using a US size 15 or 10 millimeter needles in a one by one rib pattern um, alternating uh, between these very big chunky uh, sections of knit collage with my um, hand spun this hand spun here I ended up holding um, a strand together with this DK weight um, from Lifelong Yarns that I talked about. It is 100% uh, Scottish blackface. Um, Scottish blackface is kind of a coarse fleece and this I would say I would compare this to it sort of feels cotton like it's very it's got a very dry hand and um, it also is a it is a little bit coarse but I do think that I think you can see it best here um, in the wet block it did sort of fuzz up and um, it plumped a little bit and it ended it got a little bit of a halo which I I don't know if you're gonna be able to see I'm gonna try not to knock the microphone yeah I think maybe you can see it a little bit there it's not we're not um, served by having these natural colored walls behind me um, it would probably be better if they were dark for you to see that halo but um, trust me there's a halo there uh, this has quickly become a very treasured cherished thing for my cat he just loves it um, he I often find that you know he usually sleeps with me but Lately, he's been, I found him asleep on this and I actually had to steal this from him in order to show it to you. So I'm going to go put it back on the Ottoman that he likes to sleep on so that he could curl up on it again. He's not feeling well, actually, poor little guy. He's had a, a little bit of a kitty cold, just sneezing a lot the last few days. So, um, and you know, cats get head colds just like we do. Um, so yeah, that's my finished object. 
That took, when I wet blocked it, I was worried it was gonna take forever to dry, like days and days. It dried pretty quickly, actually. I did use um, a drying rack versus using the blocking mats that I usually use, and I just kinda draped it over it in different ways to get the uh, water to evaporate pretty quickly. But yeah, super happy with that. Um, I also have a half finished object, a hoe, I guess people like to say. I have been um, you know, doing a little here and there on my other projects and I finished one sock. Um, this is the DRK Everyday Sock Pattern and I am knitting it out of sport weight yarn, Indie Dyed from Olan and it's an OOK, one of a kind, OOAK, one of a kind. Um, from uh, Olan and I've got it in like a mystery skein pack or something like that that she did when she was trying to reduce her stock um, a couple years ago. I mean she does it probably every so often. I just haven't bought any mystery skein packs in quite some time. Um, and I have uh, cast on and knit a little bit on the second sock so I'm trying to get these done. I found, um, if we could just talk about sock knitting for a minute here, I found that I really enjoyed knitting the DK weight socks and I want to get a jump start on some uh, gift knitting that I'll be doing, you know, as the year progresses. So I think I'm going to just knit up several pairs of DK weight socks for some men that are in my life, meaning my children my sons and uh, some friends that um, you know whose birthdays and other uh, Father's Day and things like that are coming up so I just thought maybe some nice cozy socks would be nice so oh so as I was saying I have found that I really enjoyed knitting those DK weight socks that I knit for my friend one of my friends in December and um, I want to make more DK weight socks and I think they're they make kind of a nice cushy squishy uh, feeling sock too. I don't have a lot of DK weight yarn though. Uh, I have one more skein. Oh no, that's not true. I have two, two skeins of some uh, DK weight sock yarn, meaning it's uh, superwash with nylon in it, uh, superwash merino and nylon. So I have two skeins of that too. But what I was thinking is I have so many single skeins of fingering weight superwash sock yarn and I also have probably five or so sets two pair two two skeins of indie dyed sock yarn fingering weight so I could knit two strands together to make DK weight socks so I think I'm gonna do that it will be a good way to de-stash to um, stash down rather I guess it's not, I'm not de-stashing I'm yeah, I'm using it myself. So it'd be a nice way to stash down and to use up a lot of um, yardage and some of the, you know, single skeins I have sitting over here. <laughs> so I might, I'm gonna try first knitting some uh, with two skeins that are uh, the same colorway and then I may try marling down the road or maybe doing some scrappy things with it. So I'm going to, I really wanna get these this sport weight pair off the needles so that I can start making some of those uh, DK weight um, socks and yeah get some of those like put away for gifting later on this year all right updates on my other whips oh let's talk about what Martha's wearing um, so Martha is wearing yesteryears by Max Sear Maxim Sear um, he is a uh, half of Le Garçon um, with his partner Vincent and uh, yeah he's a they both design Vincent also dyes yarn um, and this pattern yesteryear was in the um, book Worsted by Amy of La Bienname the yarn dyer in France and the book is in English I think there's also a French version but I bought mine um, Gosh, who did I buy it from? I bought it from an online source, but a US um, company so that I didn't have to pay for the 
shipping from France because that could be quite expensive. But if you, you know, if you want to order it directly from Amy, you can. She's been, I think she's been signing the copies that are shipping out from La Bienna May. So there's that if that's extra incentive. Um, the book has about 20 or so patterns. I talked more about it last uh, in my last episode. So um, just to show you though the progress on my sweater, it is coming to a, an end. I did um, knit the sleeves ahead of knitting the body because I wanted to be able to make the body as long as I wanted to without worrying about playing yarn chicken. And um, I'm really glad I did go ahead with the sleeves because it, uh, I'm now like on my very last skein. I'm about halfway through, I'd say, or maybe a little less than halfway through um, the skein. And uh, yeah, I like I said, I'm getting pretty close. The Martha's my size, she's my mannequin, she's my size. My waist is right here and that's about where it's hitting. I'll also get some growth and blocking because color work like this always grows a bit because it looks a little close fitting to me around this area but I think it's going to expand in the in the wet block that I'll be giving it um yeah so I, I believe I will get another like four inches or so which will be perfect um I did decide to tip I think you can see there in the contrast color I decided to tip the sleeves and I'll be tipping the um waistband as well out of this lovely hand spun uh, from a beautiful bat from frost fiber or frost yarns actually I think it's frost yarns uh, I spun the bat in such a way that um, I think it's a did I do a three ply yeah I did a three ply and I spun it in a way that I ended up with a color changing yarn this is this is a little old I've had it um, I've spun it probably like two years ago I'd say um, yeah it was really fun really fun spin I ended up spinning I still have one more of her bats I think I bought four in total and I've spun up three of them and they're all there there are three very similar colors like they both they all three have some rust and these like purpley blues in it but this is this is um Pantone's color of the year I was realizing that periwinkle so yeah, that's what you're seeing. This is one color, uh, one yarn that uh, color changed. It's not one color, it's one yarn. Um, that color changed as I knit. And I really, really love the way it came out. So that, there's the back for you. A little bit more, there's some short rows in the back. Um, so a little bit more. All right, yeah, loving this. This has been really, really great. The only thing I can say about it that I don't like <laughs> It has nothing to do with the pattern. It's more just the characteristic of the yarn. It's indigo dyed and the bleeding that happens. I think you can even see even after washing my hands, um, the um, crocking that happens um, of the yarn on my skin is not fun. Um, I did pre-wash it to get some of that dye out. Uh, mo I thought I rinsed it pretty well, but um, nevertheless, it's still crocking. So I'm interested to see what happens when I wet block it. I have a feeling more dye will be released. I think that's kind of the nature of indigo dye. I don't think, because this is naturally dyed with indigo. Um, the yarn is wing in a prayer farm. I didn't say that. So yes, my hand spun. <laughs> and then the main color is wing in a prayer. Um, the happiest yarn, here it is. Here's the tag. So wing in a prayer. The Happiest Yarn. It is a blend of Shetland, Clune Forest, and Cormo, which was focused there for one split second, but then stopped. Uh, it's considered a light worsted, and yeah, um, the colorway is blue jeans. It's really, really pretty. I actually went on her website last night to just see if there was more of this yarn, and of course there isn't. Um, there's this, The Happiest Yarn, but not this color. Indigo sells really fast. People really, really love the idea, I guess, of, you know, getting a blue or a silvery blue in this case. I think the yarn is naturally gray, um, so that's why it's looking a little more silvery. But I really, really love the, the variety, the variation that's happening with the color. I think that's very pretty. In fact, 
on this sleeve you can see there's a line this is where I had to add a second skein and um, yeah it was really contrasty here I don't think I'm going to do anything about that. Um, it's just going to be, it is what it is kind of thing. Um, and I think you can, you if you looked closely, you could faintly see where I uh, changed, because this, I attached the yarn here, of course, to knit the sleeve down. And you can see a very faint color change, but it's much more sharp down here. Um, but yet, when I, add, when I went back to start knitting with this other color, no, there's no line at all. So um, I think the yarn, the way it was dyed, there's some, it's tonal. It's a tonal dye, right? It's just not as noticeable because of the colors that um, it, it's, you know, the way the color was applied to the yarn or ended up, the yarn ended up taking it. So yeah, this is probably just an unfortunate, um, where I ended up like putting something that was the darkest next to some another section that was the lightest, but whatever, it's fine. If it bothers me, I'll rip it back and re-knit it um, with another yarn that's a little bit darker toned. Um, but interestingly enough, that skein that's here is the exact same skein that I went back up here and started to knit downward. And yeah, so it's kind of weird. I don't really understand it myself putting it out there as something that I found a little bit annoying. I'm having some water, just plain water um, this morning. It is morning, actually, I didn't say that. And it is also uh, very, very, very cold out in um, here in Northern New Jersey where I live and work and craft. Um, I also did not talk about what I'm wearing. I am wearing the Papa sweater by Junko Okamoto. It is a old knit from a few years ago. I knit it out of um, Nightshades, the blue colorway. I think it's called Last Call. And then the um, blue green that you're seeing in there is Dream State, Spin Cycle Dream State in the colorway Deep Bump. It's a really sloppy because it has such deep, deep armholes. Like my armpit's way up here. Um, yeah, it's kind of a, a, a sloppy to me. <laughs> Maybe maybe someone else would describe it as cozy. Um, it's not so convenient because if you lift your arm up, the whole sweater comes up too. So it's great for just like sitting around and you know all like cozy under a blanket while you're you know knitting or um, you know watching a show or socializing. So it's great for that. Uh, not so great for. Um, I, I don't really wear this to work unless it's like a casual Friday kind of thing because it is sort of um, big open neck and big drapey armholes and just not really my style I, I don't think and not really not really professional looking I guess is probably more yeah but hey it's warm and cuddly and cozy the yarn is amazing and I should really make something else out of uh, Harrisville designs nightshades or daylights because I really really love both of them same yarn just different colors that's a story for another time um, okay my other projects I haven't made a lot of work on these other on these two shawls my other two projects are shawls um, this one, this first one, is a uh, Helios Shanklet um, by Flaxfield Designs, and it is um, an advent knit that I um, have been, to be honest, slogging along on. Um, I haven't really, I'm still on day 16 of the advent. Um, I'm very close to moving to day 17, and then quickly after that, day 18. Um, but I'm still working on this section, which is um, the apply, an applied border section where you're um, knitting back and forth on about 25 stitches in this slip stitch pattern and you alternate between a sock yarn and a mill spun yarn. And so when I run out of 
one or the other I would attach so if it's sock weight I'll attach another color another mini skein of sock weight if I run out of the mill spun I'll attach another mini skein of mill spun and there's also this like color gradient that's happening um, with each mini so each day of the advent we were opening um, skeins that made a, a color gradient as you're seeing here so up here at the top this is this was day one and then it just goes all the way through day two day three day four sometimes you're knitting two colors together like here and here um, all the way down through these beautiful golds and greens and now we're into this like sort of um, pinkish color going that is going to move over into a plum tone pretty dark plum tone I think Martha's blocking but right on the bed right right here <laughs> right here on this little corner here you can see yeah right there that's the darkest color right there so it's a kind of a black plum color I'd say is what we end up with um, so anyway, yeah, slowly making my way around doing this applied border where you are attaching, um, you're, you're uh, knitting two stitches together, so the last stitch of this row with the one stitch of the border. So it's very, very slow going, which is why I said it's a bit of a slog. I've only done this much, and I've got, there are about 600 stitches all the way around here, this right here, and I've probably knit maybe a hundred of them so I have a ways to go um, with that so that that's that's what's happening with that I'm I'm not um, I'm not tired of it yet I am a little frustrated with how slow it's going but it's just the nature of knitting that many stitches and you know this big of a project I mean the finished photos look amazing so I'll put those on here so you can take a look at those um, I think yeah I mean I think it's a really really pretty project and um, oh my gosh I'm having some tangled stuff over here um, I think it's a really great project it's beautiful I mean the, the finished result is going to be wonderful but I don't see me finishing it anytime soon just because that border it's not mindless knitting I mean that whole shawl that whole shanklet is not mindless knitting there's very little mindless knitting on there you've got to concentrate and um i i do like kind of having a mix of projects some that are mindless and some that are that you need to concentrate on but when you have to concentrate on something you're just slower so that's that's you know <laughs> that's what's happening there um, all right I have a second shawl that is also from an advent and will also take some time although um, this is a mindless knit so I do think I'm moving um, more quickly on it and this is am I showing you the right side nope I'm showing you the wrong side this is a half and half triangle wrap that I'm making I'm calling it like a scrappy version but I'm also knitting it in DK weight yarn so I am creating this from um, a mini skein set or sorry an advent mini skein set um, from cashmere treats uh, and I'm incorporating some other scraps and you know dribs and drabs of 100% cashmere yarns that I had um, left over from projects so like this yellow is Clinton Hill cashmere but all, everything else that you're seeing in here is uh, our cashmere treats colors like some s single skeins that I bought from her and um, also like this red is from the advent from last year I just never used it um, my last year in 2020 I bought the, her 12 skein mini skein set in DK weight 100% cashmere yarn and uh, this year I bought the 24 skein one and I knew I mean when I bought it I didn't know what I wanted to do but by the end of the summer I had already decided I was going to do this pattern um, this half and half triangle wrap by Pearl Soho um, you, it if you are familiar with Caddy Jack's knits you know that they did a year-long knit along last year of the half and half triangle wrap It is a pattern intended for fingering weight yarn and um, yeah I knit one using yarn I had on hand because I was all about the stash down or trying to use stash wherever I could and um, 
I finished it. It took me a long, long time. I started it around the beginning, around this time of year last year, and I don't think I finished it until a good five or six months in um, to the year. And I think this one will go faster because it is DK weight. I'm knitting fewer stitches and I'm also making more progress. Um, what I did with this was I divided the yarns in its 24 days, 24 days mini skein set. So I divided the yarns days one through 12 are ones on one side and days, um, 13 through 24 on the other side. And then I kind of pooled in with those. Um, so the days one through 12 is, uh, started with this, um, terracotta color and went into pale pinks and then into deeper pinks which is what I'm knitting now and then ending with a lavender grayish lavender tone color um, and then on the other side they are um, yellows and greens and blues and purples blues and purples so this will be what's on the other side on the second half and hopefully I have enough yarn I'm not really sure I think I do um, I think I have enough it may get a little more scrappy as I get towards the top um, if you're not familiar with the pattern uh, what you do is cast on a whole lot of stitches uh, a certain amount I did a little over 200 like maybe 205 or so I just cast on I did long tail cast on and I just um, intended to do 200 ish and I just kept going kept casting on so you cast on whatever a certain amount so you can give, get an idea of how big it is and uh, then you do um, you knit across and every row you knit one stitch less so every every two rows you're knitting one stitch less so on one side you're keeping the edge straight and on the other side it's it um, is becoming a an angle so that's the triangle that you're making so I'm what I would judge sorry I keep showing you the wrong side um, what I would judge I'm about I think I'm beyond the halfway point in terms of knitting um, because because each row gets shorter and shorter so this I'm the row here is ending right here because here's my stitch marker telling me to turn around um, yeah, so I would judge that I'm more than halfway done with the knitting just because of um, where I'm at and judging by, you know, the, the first one that I made. So yeah, this is coming along. This is really, I mean, the yarn just feels so amazing in my hands. I really, really love knitting it. And when I... Um, feel like I should put this down or maybe I just don't want to get my hands all covered in blue dye <laughs> I've been knitting this um, thing this this beautiful project yeah so that's where I'm at that is uh you're all caught up on my knitting <laughs> I am clearing off an uh, old spinning whip from my spinning wheel um be it this project got bumped off of my um spinning wheel when Advent season started and I opened the beautiful Rambouille Rainbow Advent from Green Goat Ranch that I have shown you before um, through Vlogmas and also on my last video. Um, this is going to be a three ply, a thick and thin bulky three ply. This, um, this is the thick and thin part and then the strategy is to um, the other two plies are a very thin single ply um, white merino uh, wool. So this this is two of the three ply. This is the um, thick and thin that I have spun from Classy Squid Fiber Company Parisian Confectionery. It's a fun mixture of a lot of different fibers, primarily merino. Um, and Polworth and then a bunch of other fun um, little bits in there. Um, this is a Lazy Kate that came with my spinning wheel. It is um, my, my spinning wheel. It's Kromsky Sonata. And uh, this is really meant for these three of these smaller bobbins. So I have a little bit of um, overlap here. I'm going to see how it goes. I, I do have the on wheel um, 
spindle holder, bobbin holder that I could use for uh, one of them. So I may pop that on there. I'm just going to see. Um, they might rub on each other, but this is also a very, very short. It's only about 40 yards, this whole thing. <laughs> so, I mean, each bobbin is about 40 yards, so it should go pretty quickly. And then just to finish telling you about it, I have um, on my wheel, I've got the uh, jumbo flyer and bobbin. So this has a much larger orifice than the standard um, uh, flyer. And what that will do is give my, um, my bulky, <laughs> plant my bulky three ply here it'll give it a little bit more loft and um, allow it to be a little thicker as I spin um, so yeah so this is my my standard setup and uh, my lazy kate's on the floor there I will grab the three strands and um, begin plying them onto this big bobbin here <music> just bring this back. I finished all four skeins of this rainbow, um, self-striping rainbow yarn that I made from Green Goat Ranch um, eight-day advent calendar. So I have quite a lot of yardage. Um, could make a couple fun projects. I have no idea what I'm planning to make. I just wanted to quickly show you that. And um, I'm going to try to, this afternoon, cake uh, one of these as along with another thing that I finished that I want to show you. Um, yeah, so I'm going to cake one. So if I cake one, I'll put a picture on screen so you can take a look at how it is lining up in the skein. I think it could be really cool. I also finished, I had started this before the Advent spin started in December, and I was only about halfway through the spin on this. This is some long tail, or sorry, yeah, long draw, <laughs> long draw. <laughs> spun slubby yarn so you can see there's um quite a it's quite textured um occurred so I thought I thought this would make a fun hat maybe for Julie my granddaughter um I don't know just making yarn <laughs> all right I have a clip about this as well so I'm gonna have you watch that Hi there I am uh, starting a new spin project and I just thought I would um, show you the fiber prep because I think this is very helpful for people who maybe are new to spinning or don't know anything about spinning. Um, so I got some comb top from um, Pancake and Lulu. This is her colorway squid games. It was a um, 
I think a, a one-off or maybe two-off uh, order for um, a color inspired by the show Squid Game. And yeah, so it came, you can see I laid it out in sort of a snaky format so you could see the way that it was colored. So it starts or ends, depending on your perspective, um, with pink and then goes into these sort of green golds and then into turquoise and then finally this um, uh, sort of like bluish green, sagey green color at the very end with um, hand painted splashes of red and stuff. And this, this piece that you're looking at, I've already stripped down and created what we call nest, fiber nests. And what I decided to do for this spin is do a three ply. So I'm doing three bobbins. Um, I'm doing a three ply fractal spin. So three bobbins. One bobbin is a chunk of fiber that's just spun in order. So pink to blue. The second bobbin is going to be two of these nests where I'll spin pink to pink to blue to green rather, um, and then pink to blue to green. So that bobbin will have two repeats of the color. Um, so one bobbin, one repeat, one bobbin, two repeats, and the third bobbin that I think I set it up for four repeats. So one, two, four. And what will happen is that um, one bobbin will have a very long stretch of pink. The second bobbin will have half as much pink at the beginning, and the third bobbin will have a quarter as much pink. So I'll end up with a stretch of pink and then a, uh, a stretch that's um, two plies pink, one ply will start turning into the next color, these golds and stuff, and so on and so forth. So um, color-wise, it, it, it should be a pretty nice uh, mix, and it should sort of self-stripe, and it should kind of look like, if you're familiar with spin cycle yarns, it should kind of look like the spin cycle yarns, but I will show you the result when I'm done. And this is the finished skein. Um, of uh, Squid Game by Pancake and Lulu, some fiber that she, I think actually you can still get it. I believe you can still get it. I think I saw it on her website. I was checking out some stuff that, she, some other stuff that she had for sale. I really, really love the way this came out. I think it'll be make a really cool, it'll, it'll um, color change the way this does, but it'll be of course these colors. So it's got like this hot pink, sections that are really hot pink and um, these, low tone greens in there and also some some bright turquoise um, sections as well like I think maybe you could see right there and then also lots of areas that barber pulled because this I spun this as a three ply um, where I did a fractal spin on of a ratio one two and four which I think you saw I talked about in the clip yeah love this love this I have to say like I was a little skeptical of this like very light green that section when I saw the the um, comb top the way that um, Amy had painted it um, yes the, the way that Amy had painted it I I was like a little skeptical because I really really loved the keyed up turquoise and the keyed up pinks that I was getting that I saw but I was like this sagey sort of bluish green I don't know if that's such a you know gonna work so well but it really works incredibly well um, so yeah Love, love, love it. I know she has a pre-order right now for some Valentine's Day um, comb tops, and I, I'm trying really hard to um, not buy anything this year. So um, yeah, what I do is I tell myself, when I'm ready to buy again, there will be some beautiful fiber or gorgeous yarns that I'm going to want as much as I want these. So I just, um, close my browser and <laughs> end it. Um, I also wanted to share with you um, this really awesome mini skein set, also in Squid Game color, that um, I had ordered when I ordered this. And I didn't get this. I didn't get the mini skein set. Instead, I got uh, some gorgeous sock yarn, which I think was behind me. I think it's over on the bed. I got a uh, skein of sock yarn instead of a big skein, a 400 gram skein. And um, I, it was a mistake, an in innocent mistake that Amy made. And I told her, don't worry about it. But she went ahead and gifted me 
a mini skein set um, to, I mean, it was just like so kind of her. So nevertheless, I'm super appreciative of this very, very beautiful um, mini skein set from uh, Pancake and Lulu. Love it. Oh my gosh. And they're on sparkle bases. So, and I mean, if I wanted to, I could do something, could do something with that. Yeah. Really, really pretty. Great colors and a lovely note from Amy as well. All right. Oh, other spinning real quick. I um, showed you, I will show you a clip of some of my future spins and then I'll, I have a little update for you. Hey, I just wanted to show you what I do to sort of inspire me to begin another spinning project after I finished a couple of them. Um, so what I did was I gathered in my spinning basket, which I, I showed this on my, on my um, Vlogmas. This is a um, cotton woven basket um, from container store, I think. Uh, anyway, I just kind of, I gathered in here some different um, roving and I guess it's all roving actually. These might be mini bats. Different things that I was interested in trying. So this is some, a blend, Shetland Merino uh, flax and viscous and nylon. This is um, some fin wool from Solitude in this cool zebra pattern. This is a um, roving. And then I also have Into the World uh, Gray Cordale from my club color in June, club color last year, but look how pretty. It's like grays and blues. This will be so, so pretty. And last, I have this blend. I don't remember the, the vendor. I'll put it on screen if I can find it. Um, this is some BFL Merino um, nylon flax and sorry, silk. So yeah, I just kind of put these all together in this basket. The idea that when the mood strikes me, I will... Um, start spinning. So I have actually prepped this. So this will be the next thing I'll spin. This is all set. Like, so I decided to do a two ply. I'm going to let the yarn decide the weight. And uh, yeah, I just divided it. So the second bag is right there. Speaking about spinning projects, I have um, about, I want to say 10 ounces of this lovely naturally colored um, Poworth from uh, Nan of Sea Color Yarn. She has a farm, a sheep farm, and she has Polworth. I think she was the first person to have Polworth here in the U.S. Um, so anyway, yeah, the <laughs> I have a bunch of this, and I was thinking about, of course it's a sweater's quantity, and I was thinking about spinning it to a worsted weight for the Don't Look Up sweater, one of the three sweaters that Jennifer Lawrence wears in Don't Look Up. So um, if you don't know which one I, I mean, I will pop it on screen here. And uh, also you can look at the hashtag Don't Look Up Sweater on Instagram if you're on Instagram. I did go ahead and spin a bobbin of that uh, Polworth yarn from, or Polworth fiber from Sea Colors yarn. And yeah, I, it's interesting. I think it's a woolen prep um, because it really has an interesting halo. I'm going to see. I mean, this is just one bobbin of single ply. So I, what I'm going to do is I have, uh, I think I said I have about 10 ounces. It's a good sweaters quantity. It may be, I might use this for the... Um, uh, don't look up sweater that people a few people are knocking off uh, and hand knitting um, the sweater had um, originated from Target <laughs> and then it ended up on Jennifer Lawrence in the movie don't look up so it's like a cheap acrylic um, sweater that was probably probably retailed for under $30 but um, people, those of those crafters like us are knitting and uh, spinning for it and knitting, um, versions that would 
you know, cost a couple hundred dollars, I guess, um, upward or could, could conceivably cost that much. Or maybe you're knitting out of knit picks or something like that, some inexpensive yarn. But yeah, I, I'm going to fiddle around with this. So I'm going to make, um, three or four bobbins. Um, this is about 30 grams of fleece on this bobbin, um, just spun in a, you know, fairly thin, um, See, free my other hand fairly thin you can see there like kind of like thread and there's a little bit of um, some neps I guess was probably the best way to describe them there are some neps some moments that uh, where some neps just occurred and I mean I think in hindsight perhaps oops the prep the fiber prep, like I said, is probably woolen um, a little bit. It, there's a lot of veg, veggie matter, VM, in it. Um, so I'm spending a, some time picking that out as I'm spinning. But I probably, I might, I maybe should have, this is maybe one that I probably should have combed uh, again to just like get some of that stuff out and maybe straighten out the um, fibers a little bit better. But I, I kind of okay with the way it's coming out I think I think I'm going to like it quite a lot so um, yeah so I'm looking forward to seeing what happens with that and what I'm gonna do after I've made a couple bobbins I will do some test like a yard or two of um, test strands to see whether I want to do a three or four ply um, and then this I also spun this this is uh, these are both singles I did long draw so they ended up com coming out in kind of a thick and thin pattern um, and this will be or thick and thin texture um, these will be plied together this will be a two ply uh, so this is that like isn't it so beautiful I love the colors it reminds me of river stones like mossy golden river stones uh, so this is a blend of Shetland I think I talked about it on my clip, Shetland Merino, Superfine Merino, Nylon, Flax, Wool, and Viscous. So yeah, also would make a really cool hat. Or maybe socks, I don't know, depends on the yardage. I did find with DK socks, I do need about 300 yards. So two and 270, 280, 300, something along those lines, which was why I was saying two strands of fingering weight from two skeins, I'll use um, most of those skeins. That's it for me today um, in terms of my crafting, um, but I do want to talk to you a little bit about, uh, I'm just going to pull my computer over, I do want to talk to you a little bit about allyship because I've been talking a little bit, it's been my goal for 2022 to speak to my audience, my viewers about allyship, how to be a good ally or better ally, etc, etc. And so last time I talked in episode one, I talked about starting where you are and acknowledging there's a problem. So we talked a little bit about that. And so hopefully you, please, please, please tell me if you want more information about something that I speak about, because sometimes I'm not really sure, I'm not sure how how basic beginner-ish I should make this. Um, so today I wanna talk to you about microaggressions. Um, what has happened in uh, our society, in the, U in the United States anyway, is that um, laws were passed prohibiting racism. <laughs> and when, in the, two points in our history when laws were passed um, by Congress and, you know, so federal laws were passed. The two, two times that it happened was right around in the 1870s, just after uh, the Civil War. And then again in the 1960s when um, civil rights activists really did a lot of um, work getting uh, affirmative action pa passed and, and things like that. So in those in both cases, those two occasions, when the federal laws were first passed, everything was good for a few years. But then what happens is that um, people, society, politicians um, start to figure out workarounds and they start to, to, you know, to sort of exploit the loopholes that exist in those laws. Um, so now that you know that, so 
there's like kind of these golden this golden period and then it just like goes to hell right it all just goes to shit um because the loopholes are being exploited and then like we're dealing with and that's where we're at now as society like we um the loopholes have been exploited with the laws that passed um in the you know about about 40 to 50 years ago and um there's going to have to be new legislation to help mediate some of that and the way that our um not to get too political on you but the way that our <laughs> political system is right now the um filibuster really prevents senators and congress from getting very much done and yeah so it kind of unless there's widespread agreement on something um nothing is going to pass nothing's going to happen um with changing laws um so instead states states have a lot of power um in changing laws so some states more progressive states are putting in new laws and others aren't. So anyway, long story short, what does this have to do with you? <laughs> well, <laughs> what happens when um, laws pass and it becomes illegal to act overtly racist, things just go underground. And I talked a little bit about that last time, how um, racism went from being this overt, openly acknowledged thing to being like, oh, no, 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 you can't do that anymore. And then people just society, um, media, all of the components of society just kind of um, shoved it underground. And then what happened, what you get then is a society that participates in microaggressions. Um, so the first most important thing besides acknowledging there's a problem is also acknowledging your own implicit biases. And we all have them. There's implicit biases against, um, you know, and you're, no one's exempt. No one. <laughs> we all have implicit biases. And the only way that you're going to work on your implicit biases is to, uh, or the only way you're going to get better with those biases, reduce them, is to work on them. You must be consciously working on them. Um, so I just want to bring to your attention this idea of microaggressions. So microaggressions is a term that was coined in the 1970s by a Harvard University professor named, uh, I want to say his name is Chester. Um, oh my gosh. And I don't remember. It, it can take the form in terms of with, it could take many, many forms, microaggressions. It's any time, it's, it's, a, it's not just, um, it's sometimes, sometimes microaggressions can be, can be like taking the form of like, as if it's a joke, um, that can be a microaggression. It's usually delivered with the intention of, um, making the person feel like an other, whether, whatever you're othering about them, whether it's their disability, um, their sexual identity, their gender identity, their um, their race, their ethnicity, you're othering that um, person or group of people. So it could be things saying things like, where are you from? Where were you born? <laughs> you speak good English. <laughs> um, you're so articulate. Uh, when I look at you, I don't see color. Um, there's only one race here, the human race. Um, I have fill in the blank friends. Um, as a woman, I know what you're going through as a racial minority. So saying things like that. So those are all ways in which people are microaggressive. I think another way to think of it, so the, these are like tiny little cuts. So it's not this like, you can't come in here because you're a black person. It's it's just these tiny little cuts. Like um, uh, some of the black women in our community have talked about entering into a yarn shop and being told that the bathroom's just for customers. That is an overt racist statement. Um, so assuming automatically that the woman is black, therefore doesn't knit, um, therefore is not a knitter. And we know that's not true. So um, these are the things that uh, 
I just wanted to bring to your attention this week. Um, I'm trying to really keep these short and brief and we're gonna keep talking about some of these things um, over time. Um, what I would just tell you to do over the next couple weeks is observe your own behavior and your own, like, so usually microaggressions are responding to stereotypes. So identify your own stereotypes and identify, um, just observe your own behavior and if and observe what you're hearing other people say too and when you hear something that sounds like a microaggression aggression write it down and um and think about it and you and you know let's continue talking about uh microaggressions and uh yeah all of that so oh also there I'll, I'll share down below if you want to check your own implicit biases if you're not sure there is harvard university run has been running for the last um 20 years or so a implicit bias, bias test that you can take and at the end it'll give you your results the results are pretty pretty broad um so they won't really identify exactly where your biases are but um you, it will give you some idea of where it's at. I don't know how helpful it is actually, but um, you might be interested in taking it and reading more about it. Uh, yeah, so I'm gonna end it there. I hope that was helpful, um, learning about microaggressions. I know that was like kind of a real nutshell version, um, but I think it's probably important, it's very important to, um, to me, it's important to uh, identify my own biases through um, things that I'm thinking. So, so I try really hard to think about what I'm saying before I say it. Um, sometimes we just blurt things out, especially when we're highly emotional, we will blurt things out. Um, so you want to um, correct your behavior when you're not highly emotional. And the other important thing to do with microaggressions when you get good at recognizing them or maybe you already are good at recognizing them but you don't know what to do when you do recognize them if it is an aggression that you see someone else do take some time to acknowledge to the person that the aggression was directed towards to acknowledge to them that you saw it you can do this i recommend doing this privately just one-on-one -on -one. just say hey i heard what whoever said, and I thought it was terrible. Um, just share with them, share, share, share your reaction, share, be, be authentic and genuine, but it's, it's important to acknowledge when you see something like that happen to the person who was harmed. So the per, to the person that was harmed by it. Down the road, if you have a relationship with someone who you see being aggressive towards someone else uh, or do it per, you know, perpetuating microaggressions, it, it may be important to be confrontational with that person, but I would really advise you to do that privately. Um, if you know the person well enough and you feel comfortable enough to say something to them, I would go ahead and say that. Um, don't You don't wanna be the type of person who shouts out in the middle of you know a meeting or something like, hey, that wasn't cool. Um, unless that's the type of environment or relation, or I'm gonna leave it to you to figure that out, but I would just caution against being too openly confrontational about some of these things. But do make sure you acknowledge um, to the person that was harmed, that you witnessed it, like that you saw it and that you thought it was crappy and that you want to help make, you know, make things better and, um, maybe spend some time educating that person who did it down the road or like in a different setting or something. Um, at least that's, that's the way I handle it. Um, if I know the person well, I might say something to them pretty close to the when the event happened and just say hey you know that was kind of crappy you shouldn't have said something like that um i also will acknowledge my own i mean we're all going to make mistakes so also know that you will always make mistakes but um practice self-forgiveness and then also ask for forgiveness if you harm somebody that's also super important when you're trying to practice being a good ally all right i'm going to leave it there um 
Thank you for joining me. Thank you for being here. I appreciate each and every one of you. And I'm so grateful for this opportunity to build a community with you and to chat with you about um, all the knitting and crafting things, as well as um, things that are happening um, in the broader society and stuff. I'm trying really hard not to be on a soapbox when I'm talking about these things. So I hope that came across to you this way and I will see you next time. I hope you enjoyed this little outro of some beautiful snowy weather that we had again this week. It is snow season and I, I'm here for it. I love it. See you next time. Bye.